Welcome to the New Glarus Bible Church website. Uh, we're thankful that you're visiting with us today. Uh, my hope is that you will be strengthened and encouraged in your faith as you listen to the message and perhaps as you even uh, sing along with the songs before and after the message. Uh, let, let me just tell you a little bit about our church. We are a Bible church, and that means that everything that we do uh, is centered around the Bible. Every Sunday morning, I have the privilege of asking the congregation to open their Bibles too. And I give them a specific passage. Uh, what I do is I explain it, and then I give some application on how we might apply it to our lives in the coming week. Uh, we're a family-oriented church. We have families in our church from all different ages and stages of life. Uh, we have a men's ministry, which uh, includes a Bible study, oftentimes a breakfast and men's events. Uh, we have two women's Bible studies going on currently. Uh, we have a wonderful Anawana program that is growing and reaching out to the local surrounding communities. And uh, we have a youth group, which is led by a great young couple from within our church. And at the center of all these things, uh, New Glarus Bible Church exists to glorify God by bringing people into a life-changing and growing relationship with Jesus. Uh, we know that lives are transformed as people dedicate themselves to become lifelong and fully devoted followers of Jesus. We invite you not only uh, to visit our website, but also join us some Sunday morning. And our worship services begin at 10.30 a.m. each and every Sunday, and we are located at 207 6th Street in beautiful New Glarus. We'd love to see you sometime soon. Thanks. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God.
Father, I thank you for each and every person that is here today. I pray that you will use today's um, service to, to draw us closer to you. We might have a deeper relationship with you. I pray that today that you would um, use everything that transpires in this building today um, to turn us into the men and women that you desire us to be. So, Father, um, I pray that as we sing today that we will sing um, from the bottom of our hearts. I pray that we would sing from the top of our lungs. pray that we would listen to your word attentively. And I pray that we would enjoy the fellowship that you have provided. And I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Oh, oh. 
have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Good morning, and uh, I don't have a PowerPoint today, which is kind of unusual, but uh, today what we're going to be talking about is, um, does truth really matter anymore, for those of you that are taking notes, and uh, we have been walking through the book of Matthew for a period of time, 
Today we would be in Matthew chapter 14, but since Mark chapter 6 actually gives us a more fuller account and there's more information in Mark, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6 verses 14 through 29 today. And here's a question for you. Does truth really matter anymore? It's a good question today. We look around us and we see a lot of moral confusion today as people have bought into so many lies. Uh, the great prophet of our time who has a massive following, Oprah, has been preaching a message of your truth and my truth. And uh, she, enjo- she encourages her followers to share your truth But we all know that there isn't your truth versus my truth. There is only the truth. And what we ought to be concerned about is the truth, not your truth or my truth. Uh, One one person quoted this, Truth exists, only lies are invented. Truth exists, only lies are invented. So America is in a unique time. In, In my lifetime, I've never seen so many people who want to speak out on some of the many issues that are dividing our country, yet they don't. Uh, They don't because they are afraid of the backlash. So oftentimes what we do is we self-center, censor, or we we, we don't go there when when difficult topics come up. If, If I speak on this issue or that issue, you know, this could happen or that could happen, I... I could lose my job, I could lose my relationship with friends or family. If I say what I'm thinking, so what we oftentimes do is we hold back so that we might not get canceled. Uh, We went to a family gathering recently, and I I have to admit on the way down to our family gathering, I I was kind of nervous because what if this topic comes up or what if that topic comes up? What am I going to say? What am I going to do? And uh, we need to choose our battles, don't we? And we have to choose when to speak and when not to speak. I was uh, speaking to someone in our community recently, and they told me that during our COVID season, they had lost so many of their friends. And uh, the friends that she has remaining, uh, when, when she's with them, she has to watch what she's going to say, or she might lose those friends because she's on the other side of all of these issues. So here's a question for you. Has has there been something in the last three years that you really wanted to say, but you didn't say because you were afraid of the consequences? You were afraid of the backlash, afraid of what you might lose. I mean, the odds are pretty good that um, there's been at least one time in the last three years where you have decided to button your lips or you have decided to hold your tongue or you have decided to bite your lip or put a cork in it or put a sock in it or you zipped your lips or you didn't go there. Uh, When a conversation was heading in a direction, what you did is you changed the topic. And perhaps you did that wisely. You know, we're not called to, to speak out in our mind on every issue all the time. And sometimes silence is the appropriate response. And if you've raised teenagers, you know that's true, right? <laughs> so there have been times where, you know, I've said things and, and that I didn't really need to be said, and I, I made a bad situation worse. Uh, there have been some times where we don't want to speak because we don't want to say the wrong thing and make the situation worse. So sometimes we think, well, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. You know, don't poke the bear. Sometimes we think, I don't know enough, and I'll let the professionals speak to this topic. And so sometimes what we do is we speak when we should have remained silent, and sometimes we are silent when God wants us to speak. So what I want to do today is I'm going to share with you a story And this story that we're going to be looking today is as twisted as a Netflix series. 
What we're going to see here, there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of messed up, miserable people. There, there's a sexual theme in what we're going to be looking at today. There's a divorce, adultery. There's murdery, murder. This story has everything. And the story we're going to be looking at comes from the Bible. Okay? Uh, that's what we're going to do. What we're going to see today is a mighty man with a God-given message and we're going to see a miserable man with an emotionally driven, messy life. We're going to see both of these characters in this story today. And what I'm hoping that we will be is that we will be mighty men and women carrying a God-given message. And this is what I'm hoping that we would avoid, that we would avoid being miserable people with emotionally driven messy lives so that's what we're going to be looking at today so uh first off you know who is john the baptist because he's one of the main character in the story we're looking at but if you go to matthew chapter 11 11 uh, this is what jesus said about him matthew 11 11 jesus said among those born of women there has not arisen anyone greater than john the baptist so Jesus' opinion of John the Baptist is, is rather high. He's the main character in our story today. Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to walk through a story about John the Baptist, get familiar with him. We're going to start in verse 1. First off, we find him preaching in the wilderness. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, John the Baptist, his message was primarily this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus the Messiah is soon to be coming. We see that in verse 3. We see that uh, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. We can see that in this passage that actually Isaiah, hundreds of years prior, was telling about the coming of John the Baptist. In verse 4, we see what he wore. He was not a very classy dresser. It says that John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. We see his diet. His food was locust and wild honey. Uh, John the Baptist um, lived differently. He lived differently. In verse 5, we see that he's drawing a crowd. People went out to him uh, from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. People were leaving their synagogues, and they were going out to the desert, the unair conditioned desert, because they wanted to hear from this man. We see in verse 6 that his message was effective. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John the Baptist made a, a real impact upon these people. Verse 7, we see that John the Baptist did not hold back. When he saw the many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So in other words, he is preaching a message. He, he's not trimming his message back according to who's in the congregation that day. He's actually calling out the religious leaders of the day. And in verses 11 and 12, we see that he pointed people to Jesus and he warned them about God's coming wrath. He says here in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the shaft with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist didn't hold back. He let them know that there would be a coming judgment. He is warning them. You know, in many ways, we, we look at John the Baptist and we admire him. Uh, but to be truthful, we wouldn't really want to live like him or be him, would we? I mean, I'm glad that God doesn't have this specific call upon my life. I'm, I'm thankful for people that are willing to speak up concerning uh, injustices. We need more people like that. But, but if we're really honest... How many would of you would want John the Baptist to be one of your closest friends in your closest circle? I mean, how would you how would you like to have John the Baptist in your living room watching movies with you? He would probably say, you should turn that show off. And concerning music, he might say, you should be listening to that. But here's the deal. We need more John the Baptist in the world, and there are times when we need to be a little bit more like John the Baptist. Are you with me? There are times where we need to speak, when we see injustices in the world, when we see people that are perpetuating lies. And so, you know, when I look at John the Baptist, um, I'm challenged. I'm challenged. I need to remind myself that, you know, my job isn't to make you guys feel comfortable. As a matter of fact, there are times where I'm praying that you would feel uncomfortable, not because of what I said, but because of what God's Word says. There's times when I read God's Word and I'm uncomfortable because I know that my life isn't lining up with that. So John was a mighty man with a message, but his life becomes intertwined with a miserable man with a messy life. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. I want you to go there if you have your Bibles. Mark chapter 6. We're going to walk through this chapter. We're going to find out who Herod is and all of this story. Mark chapter 6. We find it in the very first verse, uh, 14, 6, 14. When King Herod heard about this, in other words, Jesus' ministry and how it was growing, for Jesus' name had become well known, some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. And so um, Herod hears about the ministry of John the Baptist, and immediately he becomes uh, fretful because... People are saying, who is this guy? And, and what he is thinking is, well, you know, I, I took the head off of a guy whose name was John the Baptist, and, and I think this is probably him resurrected. So let's just talk a little, about, a little bit about Herod. Who is Herod? This is not Herod the Great. Herod the Great is Herod Antipas's father. This is Herod Antipas. And so we need to know a little bit about his family. Herod the Great, when I went over to Israel, we went to many sites, and many of the sites we went to were building projects that were built by Herod the Great. He was a tremendous builder. One of the things that I was most amazed about from my time in Israel was all of the things that Herod the Great had built. But Herod the Great was a mess. And his life was a mess. And people hated him. And the reason they hated him is because he taxed them extensively for all of his building projects. Um, when, when Herod the Great died, he was such a tyrant. Uh, what he had done, he knew that everybody in Israel hated him. His family was a mess. But what he had ordered is that on the day that I die, I want you to gather together all of these men. And on the day that I'm going to die, I want you to kill all of these men. And the reason I want you to do that is so that they'll be crying in Israel on the day of my death. That kind of gives you a picture of him. He had at least nine or ten different wives. Some of them he had killed. He, um, he had several uh, children, uh, some of his children because he was paranoid. So he had some of his children killed because he, he didn't want them to assume the throne before he died. 
It was said in Israel about Herod the Great, it would be better to be Herod's pig rather than his son. So this is who Herod Antipas, who we're going to talk about in this story, this is his dad. And, and you know, oftentimes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And so Herod Antipas is a mess as well. Herod uh, the Great was the one in Matthew chapter 2 that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he sent his soldiers there to wipe out all the boys that were two years old and younger. I mean, he was an absolutely vicious and cruel man. So Herod the Antipas grew up in a messed up home with a messed up father, and he ended up with father issues. Uh, he was paranoid. He was afraid of everyone. We're going to see in this passage that, that he was afraid of his wife. He was afraid of John the Baptist, even though he was dead. He, he, he was proud. He was always concerned about how he would look. He was a politician. He would tell people what they wanted to hear. He was a people pleaser. He was flawed. He was impetuous. He was ruled by his emotions. So let's look here at verse 15. Some are saying that it was John the Baptist. He believed it was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. He's paranoid about Jesus' ministry, thinking that it's John the Baptist. And then it goes on and it tells us the story. Verse 17, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put into prison. And he did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. So, I mean, this is just like a soap opera. Let me try to, try to paint this out. One, one uh, week, uh, Herod went over to visit his brother Philip. Herod uh, ruled one quarter of Israel. Uh, Philip ruled another quarter of Israel. He had two other brothers who ruled quarters of Israel. But he goes over to, to Philip's for a vacation. And while he's on vacation, he goes, I really like your wife. Her name is Herodias. And so what he does is he invites Herodias to come back with him. And what he does is he divorces his wife and she divorces her husband, Philip. Can you imagine the father family gatherings after that? <laughs> That's not good. It's not good also in the fact that these were um, the rulers of Israel. So it affected everybody politically and it affected their families. But the reason he did this was he was an emotionally driven man. Emily Dickinson, a poet, wrote back in 1862, the heart wants what it wants or else it doesn't care. And for um, Herod, what his heart wanted was Herodias, and he didn't care about the fallout. He was an emotionally driven man who made emotionally driven decisions and at this point what we see is that he has a guilty conscience because he should not have uh, upset his family by stealing his brother's wife uh, he shouldn't have upset the kingdom uh, with all of this political intrigue and now Herodias is his wife she was his stepsister or his, uh, yep, stepsister, and now he, or sister-in-law, and now she is his wife. Let's go down to verse 18. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. This is the second time that it refers to Herodias as his brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and a holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he had liked to listen to him. One of the things I want you to see is about his new wife, Herodias. Herodias is one of the most evil women in the Bible. She's like right behind Jezebel. 
okay and so she doesn't like what john the baptist is saying john the baptist says we got a double divorce going on here and neither one one of them would be scriptural and, and he keeps saying to uh, herod you have your brother's wife herodias didn't like to hear this and it says here that she nursed her grudge in other words, at the very, very beginning, she was kind of offended. But the more and more John the Baptist said it, the more and more her grudge grew. And it said that she wanted to have John the Baptist killed. But she couldn't have him killed. Why? Because Herod feared John the Baptist. And, 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 and Herod actually kind of liked John the Baptist. So what Herod did is he had him arrested and they were put in the basement of the castle and he was there for a year. Does this sound like a Netflix story? Okay. Let's go down to verse, see where we are. Verse 21. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and, and the leading men of Galilee. So in other words, Herod is having his own birthday parties, having a banquet. He invites in all of the prominent leading men, the military commanders. And, and this um, banquet looks more like a frat party. Okay? Everybody's there. They're drinking. They're getting drunk. And uh, then when everyone had gotten drunk, it says, When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. I want you to get this. He marries Herodias. Herodias brings in Salome, her daughter. Her daughter's probably in her upper teens. And uh, Herodias sends Salome in to dance for all these men. She's not doing a tap dance. This isn't a square dance. This isn't one of those Irish jigs where nothing moves but your legs. All right, you're below the knee. She's coming in and she's performing what we would call an exotic dance. She's like belly dancing. And it says here that Herod was pleased. Let me ask you a question. Is this a messed up family? I mean, how many mothers would have their teenage daughters go in and dance seductively before her new husband and the king and all of his military men while they're all have been drinking this is a messed up family Herodias is an immoral woman and she's raising an immoral daughter but let's see what happens next it says here that Herod was pleased the king said to the girl since he's very impetuous and he's emotionally driven ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you and he promised her with an oath whatever you ask I will give you up to half of my kingdom this is an emotionally driven man who's half drunk. She went out and she said to her mother, what shall I ask for? Mom, what should I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. She didn't even have to think about it. She could have as much as half the kingdom. But what does she ask for? The head of John the Baptist. At once the girl hurried into the king with a request. I want you to give me right now on uh, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Can you imagine this? This is what I want. I can have anything. This is what I want. Why did she do that? Because she had been nursing a grudge for about a year. And this is her opportune time. The king was greatly distressed. Why was he greatly distressed? Because he, he liked John the Baptist. He believed him to be a holy man, a righteous man. And he believed his wife was vindictive. So he's got this tension going on. But since he's emotionally driven, and he's in front of all of his peers, so to speak, he did not want to refuse her. I don't want to refuse my daughter-in-law, or my daughter, my adopted daughter, and I don't want to refuse my new wife. So he immediately sent an executor with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. And he presented it to the girl 
and she gave it to her mother. Can you envision this? Here's this dainty little teenage girl. She takes this platter with the head on it, and she races off to her mother, and she's very, very careful that she doesn't get any blood on her dress. Is this a messed up family? Is, are these people all emotionally driven? Absolutely. Goes on to say, on hearing of this, John's disciples came and they took his body and they laid it in a tomb. So John's disciples, men who have been following John the Baptist for years, he is their teacher, he is their rabbi, they loved him. And now they're taking his dead body out to be buried. You know, what are they thinking at this time? They might be thinking, you know what? If this is the price you have to pay when you tell the truth, perhaps it'd be better not to tell the truth. And so they go to Jesus and they tell Jesus about what has happened. And it says in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So Jesus gets in a boat, goes a couple hundred yards out the Sea of Galilee. He's sitting there and he's mourning his friend, his cousin, and the one who has preached, preparing the way for his ministry. Jesus is in mourning. So that's the end of the story. But that's the beginning of our conversation. And our conversation goes like this. Does truth matter anymore? And, and is truth worth giving your life for? You know, and, and from one perspective, we'd say, no, I mean, look what happened. John the Baptist died and the immoral, emotional couple lived. Therefore, it is not worth it to tell the truth. That's not fair. But the answer to that question is yes. And the reason is yes, because in the scriptures, God has given us a, 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 an example of what it means to have moral courage. And, and that example is here in this passage that we have just read. Uh, John the Baptist paid the price earthly, but John the Baptist will be rewarded eternally. He, I'm sure in heaven, said I did the right thing. Some of us might be thinking, well, geez, I don't know. I, I don't like those strained relationships. I, I, I don't like um, telling the truth. It's much easier to be comfortable and to blend in. So let, let me give you six thoughts about what we can learn from this story. One thing that we can learn is this. God brought John the Baptist at just the right time. He arrived on the scene just a little bit before Jesus because he was the one who was to prepare the way for the Lord. I've been telling people lately, because sometimes people today are like, well, I don't want to have kids. I don't want to bring them up in this world. But remember what Mordecai said to Esther when Esther was putting her life on the line in the book of Esther and she was going to go speak to the king? And Mordecai said this, who knows, but that you may have come to the royal position for such a time as this. God has sovereignly ordained that we would be alive today and that we would live in this crazy world. That's a thought for us to think about. God has placed us here in the year 2023. And uh, just like John the Baptist and just like Esther, he has put us here. And we might think, well, you know what? <laughs> um, I, I'm nothing like John the Baptist. But here's the deal. God raises up some people specifically for the hard job of preparing the way for the Lord, tilling up the hard ground and softening hearts. And he ordains them and he gives them a different spirit. He gives them a different temperament. And we are to be thankful for them. We are to acknowledge that not everyone is called or equipped to be just like him. Or maybe you are. You might be one of those people. Here's just another thought. But as Christians, we are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was called to um, uh, call people to repentance. 
And so we have been called as Christians to share the gospel. And what is part of the gospel message? You know, to repent and to place your faith in Jesus. So we too have been called to a ministry, not exactly like his, but we've been called to bring people to repentance. And therefore we need God's help to be bold and to be sensitive and to be obedient. Are you with me? We need his help. We can't do this on our own. Third thought, just as John the Baptist was called to speak to this situation, there will be time when we're called to speak into the situations. John the Baptist wasn't looking for this, but it came to his doorstep. In many ways, you'll, you'll be out there living life and doing what God's called you to do and going to your job or whatever, and God will bring something to your doorstep. And he will tap you on the shoulder. And he'll say, this one's for you. You need to speak to this. You need to speak out. You need to be bold. The situation in the Old Testament. There's an evil king. His name is Ahab. Ahab, it says that uh, he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He's an evil king. He's married to an evil woman. Her name is Jezebel. You remember that story? And so what God does in 1 Kings chapter 17, he says to Elijah that there's going to be a drought in the land. And that drought's going to be there until Elijah speaks to it. And so for three years, Elijah disappears. Everybody's looking to it for Elijah. We want, we want to talk to Elijah because we want Elijah to talk to God so that maybe God would end the drought. And three years later, Elijah shows up and he goes to King Ahab. And the first thing that King Ahab says to him is, you are the troubler of Israel. This is all your fault. Have you ever had somebody do that to you? You know, you're speaking out about something that is wrong and what do they do? They turn it back on you. We see this in politics today at all? I don't know. Maybe you've seen it here or there. But this is as old as King, King Ahab. And, and so we need to be aware of that, that there would be times where we're speaking out and we're speaking towards an injustice that is going on and it comes back on us. But we just need to be aware of that. Number four, another thought. How are we to share the truth? You know, do we go in with guns blazing? Do we go in with fingers pointing? Is, is that what God has called us to do? In, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it says this. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. You know, it, it is a wonderful gift to be able to wrap hard truth in a soft wrapper, isn't it? But how many of us can do that? We're called to do that, but how many of us can do that? Um, that's what we're, we're called to do. John the Baptist didn't go in and speak the truth in love in, 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 in just a gentle way. Uh, John the Baptist had good intentions. His intentions was that Herod and Herodias would repent make their family situations right, and make the political situations right. John the Baptist had really good intentions. And the same for us. We don't, we, we don't want to go around finger-pointing at people. What we want them to do is to be right with God so that they can be right with others around them. So that's what we're called to do. Number five, we, we need to understand that being a truth-teller is hard and that there may be ramifications. You know, we look at John the Baptist's life and we say, wow, that it cost a lot. And it was costly from an earthly point of view, but it will be worth it from an eternal point of view. When God calls you to speak out, he's calling you to speak out against something that is wrong, and um, from an eternal perspective, it'll be worth it. Last point is this. You know, John the Baptist was a man who was, he was led by godly convictions. 
He wasn't just going out and finger pointing randomly. He was led by godly convictions. And God calls us, if we're called to call somebody out, that we would have godly convictions. In other words, we'd be able to point in the Bible and say, this is why I'm telling you this. It's not me, it's God. It's right here in God's word. God doesn't want us to be emotionally driven. God wants us to have convictional biblical Christianity versus emotional Christianity. Are you with me? So let me, let me just tell you um, a little bit of history. There was a time where there was this thing that was called the Holocaust. Remember that? And in the Holocaust, which was a deliberate and organized state-sponsored eradication of the Jews and what they called the undesirables, Okay, so it was, it was state-sponsored, it was deliberate, it was, it was organized, and their goal was to get rid of all the Jews. During that time, six million Jews were gassed, shot, or starved. And there were five million Soviet prisoners who were also gassed, starved, or shot. And if um, people hadn't stood up to Hitler, um, we would be speaking German today. You know, Hitler wasn't going to stop in Europe. His goal was the whole world. And, and here's the thing. Churches could have stopped it. Churches could have stopped it. There were 18,000 Protestant churches in Germany at that time. And if all of those Protestant churches had stood up with one voice and said, Hitler, what you're doing is wrong, um, there would have been no Holocaust. But here's what happened. 3,000 of the churches actually had pictures of Hitler on their sanctuary walls. And they called themselves the Storm Troopers for Christ. So in other words, what they did is they took their religious beliefs, they wrapped them together with uh, Hitler's agenda, and what they did is they said, we are storm for Christ, we are doing the right thing. Uh, and then on the other side, there were 12,000 churches that sought to be neutral. And during this time of the Holocaust, this is what would happen on Sunday morning if your church was located next to a railroad there would be railroad cars transporting Jewish people in boxcars headed to extermination camps. And as those boxcars were going by those churches, the Jews in those boxcars would be screaming out for help. Do you know what many of those German churches did? The pastor would say, take out your hymnal, turn to hymn 185, and we're going to sing, and we're going to sing loudly. And what would happen is when the boxcar had passed, they would go back to their sermon. These were churches that wanted to be neutral. But there were also 3,000 churches that um, were convictional churches that actually stood against Hitler. So what Hitler did is he used religion to silence the Christians, and as a result... World War II uh, continued, and as a result, 11 million people died. Let me just tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, the Nazis' propaganda featured Martin Luther, who was long dead. Martin Luther probably would not have lined up with this. But, but they had a propaganda pro poster from 1933 which read this, Hitler's fight and Luther Luther's teaching are the best defense for the German people. So in other words, they were taking religion and they were twisting it so that they could achieve their agenda. There was this movement, it was called the German Christian Movement, a group of Protestants who wanted to combine Christianity and National Socialism into the movement that would exclude all of those deemed impure and embrace all true Germans in a spiritual homeland for the Third Reich. There was a man whose name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a part of the Confessing Church. And uh, the Confessing Church said this. Um, its slogan was, Church must remain 
the church. And all those in the confessing church openly opposed Hitler and his movement. There was one man, his name was Ludwig Niemöller, Niemöller. And Niemöller uh, Moeller, uh, moved from the compromising churches over to the convictional church. And um, he stood up against their church. And he said this. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So there's a time where we need to speak out when we see things that are happening and we see things that are incompatible um, with our faith. Uh, the compromising church in all of Germany at that time, they had been so influenced by wrong teaching and by lies, by Adolf Hitler, what they would do when they would greet one another and when they would leave one another, they would say, Heil Hitler rather than good morning or goodbye. That is how um, much Hitler's influence had in Germany at that time. So let me just say this. The churches could have stopped this. Let me ask you this question. Does truth matter? Does truth matter? Let's pray. Father God, we uh, thank you for the fact that we do have the truth in our hands. We thank you that you're asking us to, to learn it and, and to live it. Lord, I pray that you would enable us when you tap us on the shoulder, you would enable us to stand up and speak and speak boldly, perhaps gently, caringly, kindly, but to speak in such a way for the injustices, the many injustices that are going on around us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.